Good evening. Tonight, we're going to talk about the little town of Bethlehem. When you hear of the prophet Micah, you probably go immediately in your mind to Micah 6, 8, his greatest hit. What does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? But wait, that's not our passage for this week. What else do you know about Micah? Micah was a prophet, a seer, a teller, a voice sent to relay God's truths to the people. The prophet's job was to warn, to chastise, and to offer comfort and reassurance. Unlike the scribes and priests and other religious leaders who were mostly doing ceremonial duties, the prophet was supposed to maintain a direct link to God to translate what God was thinking into words and images that his people could understand. Often, the prophet had to proclaim what the folks needed to hear, but not what they wanted to hear. Well, that's Micah. Micah was a farm boy in a town about 23 miles from Jerusalem. He was a poor country prophet who prophesied about social justice issues. He specialized in civil and human rights, which to Micah were the same as God-given rights. You see, Micah believed that it's God's will for all to prosper and to be healthy. He also believed that it's the responsibility of the rich and powerful people to care for the poor and needy folks. Those who can help should help. Those who have should share what they have with those who do not have anything. It's a simple arrangement. And with it, everyone gets what they need to survive and to live as comfortably as possible. But that's not the way things worked in Micah's day, in Micah's neighborhood. People he knew were filled with greed and lust for power and wealth. People were blaspheming against God and breaking God's commandments. People were sinning and sinning in a big way, according to Micah. And they were forgetting about God. So Micah had to get their attention. He warned them if they didn't change their ways, they and all they held dear would be destroyed. And while he offered the reassurance that God was still with them, that God would still honor the covenant made with the people, he also let them know that because God is a just God, there would be consequences for all their actions. The nation was about to be examined, and according to Micah, they were not going to pass muster. The Israelites, God's chosen people, were in for some serious suffering if they kept going the way they were headed. Although Micah is a rural farmer, he keeps his eye on the situation in Jerusalem. He's angered by the depredations of the folk in the big city, calling them thieves and false preachers and hypocrites more interested in small problems that inconvenience them than they were in the injustice rampant in Zion. Micah says they're all greedy for wealth. They hate good and love evil, both tearing and eating the flesh of the poor, breaking their bones in pieces, chopping them up like meat for the kettle, like flesh in a cauldron. We can only hope that he was being metaphorical there. These are people, says Micah, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against those who won't help to feed them. This is a hilarious and bitter picture of fat cats, satisfied and indolent, murmuring peace, peace, when they're sated with rich food, but who turn their fury on those who refuse to keep them comfortable and full. Such a portrait could be made modern by picturing wealthy people who are silent and comfortable as long as those who have less do not make any complaints. But when the poor ones demand their fair share, the rich become angry, blaming and punishing the ones who dare to criticize them. As you can see, the prophet Micah was no one to be trifled with. Imagine him at your next dinner party. You could count on him to confront you and all your guests, demanding truth and justice for all people. We don't know what specifically was going on in Micah's time, but we can get some hints. He talks about the misuse of power. He talks about the amassing of wealth and the accumulation of stuff. The rich were getting richer while the poor were getting poorer. The so-called leaders were not just corruptible, they were corrupt and they were corrupting. 
and the religious leaders were in on the deal. It was an every man for himself kind of world. Once you were born into poverty, there was no way out, regardless of how skilled or talented or ambitious you might be. The people were not being cared for in a just and compassionate way. The stranger had become a target, not a welcome guest as God had commanded. Now, we don't know exactly what they were doing in Judah back then, but we can imagine. Bottom line, the people were not living up to their side of the covenant with God. As a prophet, Micah spoke out against whatever was contrary to God's order. He called out the leaders in power, and he stood up for the poor and the vulnerable, not because they were more righteous than the rich, but because his God cared about them. Micah spoke up for what he saw happening that was not right. The people's way of life went against God's will. And because most were misbehaving, all the people were going to suffer. The prophet Micah lived about 150 years before the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. He was in the kingdom of Judah when people were all about me and mine. On the surface, things might have looked okay. The market was up unemployment was down. Most people were able to eat, but the leaders were measuring all the wrong things. There was an undercurrent of deceit, jealousy, mistrust, and fear. Micah was calling that out. He was shining light on the truth. He saw that evil was being committed, and he saw the suffering that it caused, and he wanted everyone to hear about it. He warned them to make things right or they would suffer consequences. Does any of this sound familiar? Micah believed God was offering his people a way out. He prophesies and speaks to us in God's voice. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Or I like the way Eugene Peterson puts it in the message. It's quite simple. Do what is fair and just for your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love, and don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. Scripture says that the people of Judah did not heed Micah's warning, and over time his prophecies came to pass. Jerusalem was destroyed, and the people were taken into captivity. Judah didn't listen to Micah. But before all that happened, Micah whispered this word of hope for the future. You, Bethlehem, the country of David, the runt of the litter, from you will come the leader who will shepherd Israel. He will be no upstart, no pretender, because his family tree is ancient and distinguished. Meanwhile, Israel will be settled in foster homes until the birth pangs are over and the child is born. Then the scattered brothers will come back home to the family of Israel. He will stand tall in his shepherd rule by God's strength, centered in the majesty of God revealed. And the people will have a good and safe home, for the whole world will hold him in respect, peacemaker of the world. Micah was seeing Bethlehem in her future by a very different standard that the world employs. He was, it was not about her relative size or power. It was about the one who was to be born there, the one who would make her great. There was absolutely no reason for anyone seven centuries before it happened to believe in this story, except that the same thing had been said about David when he was chosen by God to be the anointed king. Just as Bethlehem was small, so David was the youngest and least likely candidate among Jesse's sons. But the scripture assures us that God does not see things as we do, but rather God looks at the heart. Micah was seeing Bethlehem through God's eyes. Bethlehem is a place where heaven would touch earth, where the divine would intersect with humanity. For as with David and Bethlehem, God's standards are eternal, not of the moment. God's measure of greatness is based on final outcomes, not on immediate impact. Micah was seeing Bethlehem in a new way, and anyone ever connected to this little village could tell you the story of David, King David. 
It was part of their nation's history that gave them great pride. But they could not live in the past. What Micah promoted for them was a vision of the future. Yes, a great king had been born in this place many years before, but Micah envisioned something far greater, a Messiah who would be born and walk the earth. Micah could not proclaim such hope because of anything his people were doing. He clearly understood that they were all unworthy of God's great grace, but rather he could speak of such hope because of the love and grace that are the very nature of God. Micah knew they could face their tomorrows because God would be with them always. He understands that kingdoms will rise and fall, but the Lord their God was eternal. The opening of this passage was what Micah's listeners heard most resonantly. You, Bethlehem, being a little Judean clan, from you shall come forth for me, one to rule Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Of course, any mention of Bethlehem in the ears of Hebrews and later Jews would bring immediately to mind the greatest king in Israel's history, the mighty David. He was born in the tiny village of Bethlehem and anointed by the prophet Samuel as king, even though he was the eighth and youngest, a child of an unknown chieftain named Jesse. By the time of Micah, David's tenure as king some 200 years before surely seemed like days of old. Micah here dreams of another David-like king who will defeat the Assyrians and bring Israel back to its days of glory before the Yahweh who chose them as the people of God. The early Christians took this Davidic promise and applied it to their Bethlehem-born Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, thereby emphasizing his birth in Bethlehem and his direct connection to King David of Israel. And the rest of the passage added to their certainty that Micah was prefiguring the coming of Jesus Christ. Verse 5-3 is somewhat vague, but whatever it means, it surely refers to a woman giving birth. Therefore, he shall establish them until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth, and the remnant of his kindred has returned to the people of Israel. One thinks immediately of the parallel passage in Isaiah 7, where the young woman shall conceive and bear a son, calling him Emmanuel. And the next verse of that oracle, by the time the boy will eat curds and honey, and he knows to refuse evil and choose good. Even before that happens, that is, the ability of that boy to know good from evil, these two kings, Pika and Ramalia, before whom you, Ahaz, are in dread, will be destroyed. As in Isaiah, so here in Micah, the birth of a child augurs a great change in Israelite fortunes. I think verse 3 then means that God will keep Israel until the Bethlehem child is born. But when the child is born, the remnant of the scattered people will be able to return to Israel, to the flock, to the people of God. And after their return, the child, perhaps grown up, shall stand and feed the flock in the power of Yahweh, in the mighty name of Yahweh his God. And as a result of his standing and feeding the flock of Israel, they shall live because now he is great, even to the ends of the earth, a person of shalom, peace. Here Christians saw Jesus, the good shepherd of Israel, both feeding and securing the people until the ends of the earth. Furthermore, he was defined best by the wonderful word shalom. The word does not finally mean peace, although that's a part of its fuller meaning. It means unity and wholeness with harmony and completion. This miraculous boy will bring it all together again, God's people and the remnant, and even those who are yet unborn. Michael looks for a David-like king to defeat the forces that would destroy the land, one who would bring unity and peace to a newly reconstituted community one who would feed the people and secure their rights in a land finally ruled by Yahweh. Given all of this, we may agree that this choice of passage for the fourth Sunday of Advent is not a bad one. Micah reminds us that God shows up in unlikely places. 
that God ignores the bright lights and the glitz and the glamour of the big city to find his home in a village, the little town of Bethlehem. That God's own Messiah King will not be born in the palace, but in a lowly place, the place where David was born. That God's coming King will not be a man of war, but a prince of peace. What Micah wanted for Israel and the nations is precisely what the early Christians believed that the coming of their Christ would mean to the world, justice, unity, and peace. It's the hope of every Christmas. It's the hope of this Christmas. Thanks be to God for the gifts of his love. Let us pray. Loving God, you who have chosen the weak to put the powerful to shame. Give us the courage to be your people. Encourage us to rise above that which is normal and beyond that which is comfortable, to confront the future with thanks and praise. Then may things come to life in us that exceed expectation and beckon others to your glory. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.